Welcome to the Port City Plate Podcast, presented by the Amble Bites Food Tour. The Port City Plate Podcast, serving up the food, history, and people of Mobile, Alabama, for people who love the Port City. I'm your host, Chris Andrews, and I'm so excited about this episode we've got today. Got Amber Harris sitting in with me, and Amber, she's one of the most talented people in our food and drink scene in Mobile right now. I, I really do believe that. Uh, she's a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, the prestigious CIA, and, and her and her husband, Hunter, uh, started the Mon Louis Supper Club, which I had the privilege to attend um, a, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I really, I don't say this lightly, but it was one of the most memorable meals uh, of my life. And, and her and uh, Hunter also worked together at Press & Co. in Daphne. She's the general manager there. And uh, so we got a lot to talk about. So Amber, welcome to the Port City Plate Podcast. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Thank doing you so good. much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about this. So um, talk about you growing up and you know, I know you grew up here, but uh, you know, did you have a love of food? Like what was your, what was your childhood like growing up here? I've always had a love for food, um, but you've actually had the privilege to see where I was born and raised. So you've been to my childhood home. So technically a mobile, but really lived almost a dolphin Island. So um, something really cool, I think, of my childhood that first kick started me loving food and hosting, entertaining, all that, um, was we did live so far out, and I went to school in Mobile at St. Luke's, and so we got a townhouse to live closer to school. We didn't love it. We're more Bay people, no neighborhoods, no neighbors. <laughs> um, but living there, I got to bring my grandparents. My mom would have me send out like an invitation, plan a theme, and cook a dinner every summer once a month for my grandparents. So I think that's where I started getting obsessed with, oh, I love having dinner parties, and now I can make that a career. So, <laughs> and I'm sure they cool. bragged on you and made you feel special, oh, yeah. right? Had to learn how Did to... Did your confidence. Yeah, I was no opening cans. You know, Grandma doesn't expect that, so you can't open the can <laughs> and just put something together. I was making things from scratch, and I was really learning. And so... That was my positive experience from living, uh, you know, closer to town was getting to do those and taught me so much, you know, even um, how to cordially like make a menu and invite people, proper etiquette, inviting other people and setting the table, all that ties in. And so I think that's where it really started for me. Yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you grew up at, uh, you mentioned St. Louis, so we got to talk about Miss Diane. I know she like, she's been on a bunch of the Bimble Bites field trips and Mm -hmm. you helped make that connection. Uh, yeah. for us to have those but I know talk about her a little bit and, and how well we, she, she was loves us because we were the first graduating class so 2013 was the first time they had a high school um, we were the first graduating class so there was 30 of us and we they started a biomed program and so back when my dad was really encouraging me to be a doctor instead of going into culinary <laughs> um, that was the focus and now it's evolved into so many different fields within that and so she started a nutrition program and now that I've been back home, she's invited me to come and kind of share a little bit of my culinary experience. I'm learning more and more how to tie that into nutrition because that is an important side to it. Um, but she's bringing people in from like hospitals to talk about the medical effects of the food that we're eating. And then I'm just showing them how to cook it, yeah. which is the fun part. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, they just needed to see a little more and have some exposure. And I was like, Chris is doing that every single day. Go talk to him. So <laughs> they yeah. love it. And you know, kids, they would rather go try out. The oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The kids, they love the field trips. Yeah. I'm glad y'all are doing that. So it's super cool and, and fun that they're still growing it. I mean, right. that program is really unique to the area. So I'm glad they're yep. doing that. Yeah, that is. It is unique. Uh, like you mentioned, talking about food and the health benefits and all mm-hmm. that. And I think that's so important. It's going to be continue to be so important. It is. Uh, in the next few years. But what, so what, talk about after St. Luke's, I mean, what was your, what was your journey and, and especially going to the CIA, like talk yeah. about that. So my dad, I was also in charge of cooking Christmas dinners every year. Um, when mom wasn't cooking, that was my one turn to take over. Um, and so he was like, he made the comment after I cooked Christmas dinner, Amber, you're always excited when you're in the kitchen. Why don't you think about that as a career? And I was like, is that a fat joke or is it cause I really just <laughs> actually love cooking. <laughs> and then we got serious about it and I honestly Googled best culinary school in the United States and CIA popped up. So I think I was telling you a little bit earlier, but um, I just wasn't exposed to like what a culinary school could be or that field or that industry as a career. It was more like I knew we went to good restaurants and I knew good food, but I didn't know that there was an education behind it. And honestly, cities that were doing it on a much bigger field that we're getting closer to now in Mobile, but still it was such um, an expanded area that I didn't, I was not aware of. So 
Um, you know, I knew the community colleges, which they do a great job now, I think even better than it was back then. Yeah. But that was all I knew about. And I was like, where am I going to go for culinary school? So I Googled, I learned about it, and we went and did a tour. And like I was telling you, it's the Disney World of culinary for anyone that loves food or old people. <laughs> and so um, that was just an amazing experience. I thought I was going to be like in a city. No, the rest of New York is not a city. It's very rural Um, farmland huge food scene everywhere Um, and so I go up there there's a tractor driving by I pull into campus and it's just everything that you could imagine that you would ever want to know learn see for food so and I guess everybody around you as well is Mm -hmm. immersed in that too so I bet that is that was a unique experience too of like um, everyone that's attending there like they're so focused it's not going to like a regular college where you don't know what your field's going to be you could change your major at any point yeah I mean, everyone there is talking about food, wine, agriculture. So I'm like, there's no change in your mind once you're there. Yeah. Um, You're just fully immersed. So super cool. And everybody aspires to, you know, what be on the Food Network or Mm -hmm. or something like that too, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or just own a restaurant. Exactly. Um, So that was very eye-opening. You did have a requirement to work in a restaurant for six months before you went there. So I did mine at the Catfish Shack um, in the River Shack during the summers. Amazing opportunity, but I will say when I got there, I was so unprepared, like, for everything else. Like, they're talking about ramps, broccolini, things like that, that I'm like, what? I know how to make cornbread (laughs) in a skillet. (laughs) Um, Does that count? But actually, they were, like, all impressed because they're not many people were from the South, so they're like, yeah, we want to know how to make Alabama cornbread, (laughs) Alabama gumbo, (laughs) things like that. So I did shine there, but um, definitely... um, didn't know what I was getting myself into, but then when I, once I got there, it yeah. was really cool. So that's cool. What yeah. about so? What, what after graduation? What it, what ended up happening? Went straight there. So they do their um, school years every three weeks. They start a new class technically. Um, so I went up in July. I think I was the first one out of my grade to go straight to college. Um, got up there as an 18 year old. I think my parents were a little scared to leave me, but I was like, "Don't worry, y'all. I'm going to be up here, and I'm going to come right back home. I have no interest in living in New York." <laughs> No, that changed really quickly. Um, The first six months, you do your fundies or fundamentals. So you're learning square one basics of cooking. But you're getting there at 5 a.m. every morning. You're doing fish fabricating classes, meat fabricating, butcher classes. Um, I think I did an Asian class as well, all for the first semester. Then after that, you get to go on an intern program. Um, and Well, it's actually called an externship. And so I was still focused on food, but I was also like, oh, this is my chance to go anywhere in the world. So I went to Hawaii. Yeah. (laughs) Can't pass that up. (laughs) Um, So that's when I think my parents started to realize too, like I'm not planning on coming back home right away. There's a lot for me to see and do. So do they help you get the job in Hawaii? They do. Yeah. They have counselors up there that help you with your extern program. Um, It's a full binder that you go through like a program of having to see multiple different positions within a restaurant, even like a little manager one-on-one time to kind of hear more about like your food cost, how they prepare menus, things like that. And so it's very in-depth, and it was um, a really great opportunity for me to get to do that. Yeah. I went to Four Seasons, Hawaii, in Kona, Hawaii, the big island. And they treated me so well there, which was amazing for my extern program. So I started, they actually have a fish fabricating room there on site. So they were bringing in like marlin, swordfish, tuna we were breaking it down like the whole entire fish so getting to see that and that was one guy's job so that guy like he got to do that every single day from early in the morning and then he'd have it ready for dinner so that was really unique and then I would actually get to work in two of the restaurants on site um, and then quite a few catering opportunities with weddings and stuff on the beach so yeah you can't beat that that's really cool (laughs) yeah yeah I bet that was an awesome experience it really was Um, and so then went back to school and finished my two years of getting my associate's degree in culinary arts. Then I continued on for another year to get my bachelor's degree in business management. So back to how CIA works, everything is food related. I'm doing like regular classes of like um, English and literature, but it's about a food book or a food story. Okay. So you're completely immersed in it, which is really unique, but honestly still taking those classes everyone else had to take but I think it was more fun for me. Yeah, for sure. About food. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'd much rather read the food books, right? uh, literature than yeah. I would, uh, you know, 16th century. We had to take a uh, language <laughs> class. I took Italian, but then you got to go on an Italian food and agriculture cl- uh, tour of Italy. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'll learn a language That's really for cool. that. <laughs> That's cool. 
Awesome. Well, how'd you end up getting back to the Mobile area? So as soon as I finished school, and I did want to touch one more semester, I spent um, doing farm to table. I went to their Napa Valley campus, which is in St. Helena, and we spent um, five days of the week working on the farm. And everything that we would harvest, we had to create a menu, and we would cook that on Friday nights, and we'd be open to the public. That's cool. So that was awesome, and that's kind of where I think I shifted near the end of my time at school. Um, I was really trying to get involved into the farm to table and um, just learning more about ingredients that I wasn't aware of. And um, I started a private chef job, I guess. I was still young, I didn't call myself a chef yet, but um, it was a family that lived in New York City and then they spent their summers up in the Hudson Valley area. And so I was cooking for them and they had five kids and they all had different nutrition, like dietary restrictions. So that was a challenge and I learned quite a bit from that. And so then that's when I really started saying like, oh, I love catering to like someone's specific needs. Like, it's very different than a restaurant because you know what they like, so you're going to get it right eventually yeah. once you learn them. Um, you're not having to please multiple people with different personalities or tastes. And so um, that was the next step was um, to do more of the private chef yeah. type things. So. And just cooking for kids in general is a mm -hmm. challenge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Much Imagine less if they have dietary needs. And have lived in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That was unique. And then I was like... Um, well, I want to keep doing that and cooking for specific people. So I was going to do it on a yacht because that's way more fun than just being on land. And I went straight to Miami after school and got a job working on a yacht, being a private chef. That's cool. It was amazing. All right. What did you see on that yacht? So the first one, <laughs> I saw a lot of things. Um, <laughs> the first one we did the East Coast. So we started in Maine and we went all the way down to Fort Lauderdale. We hit all along the East Coast and it was an older couple from France. So really, I think they were teaching me more than I was teaching them. Um, but that's so awesome. Like, what an experience looking back. Um, they were teaching me like a French bean soup. And it's basically where they take a green bean and they cut it in slices on a bias. And they would call it slurp soup. And it's because you have to slurp up all the beans. I'm like, this is ingredients we have here in the States, but the French make it so much cooler. So yeah, I was getting to learn a lot. That's cool. Um, so that one was unique um, and really a cool first time experience, but then it got bigger from there. So the first one was a 93 foot yacht, then I moved on to a 97 foot, and then at the end of my time I was on a 179 foot yacht. So wow. 15 crew members per 20 guests. So I was actually the sous chef on that one, so I had someone else kind of leading me, guiding me, which I think was uh, really special and needed. Yeah. <laughs> I did the first two on my own and straight out of school. So definitely learning curves and a lot of opportunity for me to learn there. But um, having someone I was working under, he also taught me a lot about professionalism too that I didn't realize I hadn't been exposed to yet out of school. Um, you know, you're living on the boat, so they see you all the time, but you have to turn on your work mode versus your life living on a boat. So like showing up, he'd be like, have your hair ready, have everything like full uniform on. Like you're at work, like you show up to work yeah. at 4 a.m. <laughs> and if everyone else is getting sick on the boat because we're through rough seas, you don't get to do that. You have to cook because they need right. food when they're better. So um, got to travel all over the um, Caribbean area. So that was amazing. Um, great money, great opportunity to just see the world and get to cook and with ingredients again that I had never seen. So yeah, yeah again, my parents are like, she's not coming home. <laughs> um, I did love that and I best first job ever. Um, I would do it again, but I was very ready to get back to land and like, how do you start establishing a family or, you know, a further career when you're out all the time? So I that's cried. why I kind of turned around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, cause I guess well, there's not, I guess not a lot of opportunity to max out your career yeah, I mean, you can that. just hop in boat to boat, you know, yeah. which, yeah, I'd see more boats and more, like, I think the next one, they were going to go on a trip to the Mediterranean, which would have been really cool, yeah. but it's a hectic life, you know, like, it, it was um, super fun, amazing opportunities, but it is, it's, you work hard, you play hard, and sometimes they play too hard for me, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I always share the story of, like, a Christmas morning, the captain had, like, rented an island, and a whole party was planned all day, and I was like, wait, this isn't what Christmas is about, <laughs> that's why I think I need to get back home, <laughs> um, so... Yeah, amazing. Would, wouldn't trade it for the world, but there was a time limit for me on that. To right. Like, okay, I got to get back to real life and continue my career in another direction if that's what I want to do long term. Yeah. So, so talk about how you got got started here in the restaurant scene and 
got to your mobile. Yeah, so finally I was um, did a few other jobs here and there, but eventually wanted to get closer. My family's from here, and I just knew this area. I knew what our culinary scene was about. I knew it was growing, so I wanted to be a part of that. And actually ran into Panini Pete. I know all of y'all know him. So he went to the same culinary school as me at CIA, and he was up there for an alumni event, and we ran into each other before I had graduated. And he was like, if you ever want to come home, like, come see me. And I was like, that's not going to happen. No, it did. I came home from Christmas right when he had bought Ed's on the causeway. And I actually stopped in to just see if he happened to be there, and he was. And him and Nick DiMario, they're running it together. So they stop over at the table, and they're like, if we can get you to come home, like, we'll teach you whatever it is that you want to know. And I was like, oh, I was really going to go to, like, Atlanta or Birmingham or something, but I guess I'll come on back. And so I did, and they put me in at Sunset Point over in Fairhope. Uh, started me as a line cook. They really humbled me, put me back down at a starting wage, you know, to see what I was about, if I was all talker, if I could do it. And I did for a few weeks, and they promoted me to bar manager. And so that was my first, like, manager job and being out of the kitchen, honestly. And they did exactly what they said. They taught me everything they could and worked my way up to um, eventually being the GM over at Squid Ink, which is where we met. Yep, that's right. So, yep. super cool. That's right. That's where we met, doing the Bimble Bikes tours, coming through there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess, and also, I mean, what you, you, so the job at Sunset Point, I mean, it changed your life mm-hmm. in more ways than one, right? I mean, oh, you, yeah. you and Hunter your, your came spouse along. met there, right? Yep. Hunter was living in New Orleans at the time, working in restaurants, and COVID shut them down a lot longer than we did. And so Nick is actually his um, uncle. And so he was like, why don't you come over here and work in one of our restaurants? And so we met at Sunset Point. I'll tell you a little bit about that story. We went on a date. Of course, everyone knows everything in that area. So it got back around really quick. I think uh, Nick had me sit down in the office and was like, is this serious? Because if so, y'all got to be at different restaurants. And I was like, I don't know. Ask him. It's been one date. So Hunter gets called in the office. And Hunter's like, yeah, I'll date her again. So uh, we made it work. We got married, right? I guess it was worth it. So um, super funny. And our first date actually was at Serial Killer, which is Wade's re- okay. first yeah, restaurant yeah. that he had. Wade so, Price, Clark yeah. Society, yeah. <laughs> So super funny. Yeah, we had the fried chicken ramen bowl, shared that, really, really romantic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was definitely worth it. It changed my life and learning how to run a, run a restaurant. And yeah, I got to meet Hunter and so super right. amazing. And he stayed on as the executive chef there while I continued at Squid Ink being the GM. So. Yeah. And how'd y'all both end up at Press & Co? And so yeah, after Squid Ink, I took a little break to go to Steelwood because um, I really wanted to learn more about like event planning and they do weddings there, larger facility. Um, and that was amazing. And it gave me a little more time too. Um, you know, we're, we weren't working nights. We didn't have dinners. So um, I got to start planning a little bit of the supper club that we're a part of now. And um, Hunter went on to be uh, the executive chef at Press & Co because they just opened up in August, but he was brought on last May. So we're at a year already. And um, he got to help them create the whole menu from scratch. And I just kept popping in because I was curious of what he was doing and built a really great relationship with Kimberly Cox, the owner. And so now, almost a year later, she invited me to come on too. And I can't pass that up because obviously me and Hunter finally were working together. And um, <laughs> it was bound to happen eventually, right? Um, and it's great. It's been going so well. I've been there for a little over two months now. And, um, I mean, for a place that just started in August, it's doing so well. Yeah. And it's really unique to the area. Um, a little bit about it is it's in downtown Daphne, right behind Mancy's across from Dragonfly area. Um, and that area is just really growing in general. But they, they still need more restaurants, so y'all come over that way. <laughs> um, but offering healthy, organic options to the area and kind of just making people aware of what's in their food, but also making it accessible because that just really wasn't the case before. Um, it's really spiking a lot of my interest from back in my farm to table days and just learning like how we can educate the the area as well you know we have so many farms over there but we really struggle to find organic farms I know it's it's expensive to get the label but there's a lot to it to get that and so we're sourcing a little bit out of Louisiana and then if to get the organic products and if we can't get it organic then we're at least trying to get it as local and clean as possible yeah so so what are some of the menu items on the menu there what are what's popular so we're breakfast and lunch. We're open every day, 7 to two thirty. And um, our breakfast menu, we do gluten-free Belgian waffles, but we don't say they're gluten-free because sometimes that scares people. But everyone loves them. I'm like, you can't even tell they're gluten-free. 
Um, so those are amazing. Our sweet potato hash bowl, we're getting local Robertsdale um, sweet potatoes. Um, Hunter covers them in a spice, so they're super spicy. We've got um, cage-free organic eggs, and um, it's just like a, I mean, our all our breakfast items are amazing. They're super filling, really healthy, great way to start your day. Um, and then we go into lunch, and Hunter runs a special every week, so sometimes I get to sneak in a special, and that's really <laughs> fun, so I'll vote for that. Um, I ran like a organic Greek yogurt with garlic. It was a savory yogurt. So this was a lunch special and it had artichokes and nuts and goat cheese. And so it was just like light and refreshing, something that you don't really get around here often. Um, but really just highlighting all the organic ingredients that we can get our hands on. So. Yeah. All right. I got to get over there. Yeah. I come on. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to come see y'all. It's so great. All right. So let's talk about the Mont Louis Supper Club. Yes. So that's Hunter and I's project. We've, um, devoted the last year to it now. We started last June, it's crazy. Uh, our first one we ever did was in June and I think we picked the hottest day of the year. <laughs> so we scared off our first bunch, but um, they've all been back again, so we really appreciate it. But it's at my home that my parents um, built and they still have that house and have graciously let us destroy their kitchen and run a <laughs> supper club out of it. So um, I just, I'm biased to the area, but I love the bay. Like that's, when you talk about hometown, like that's everything to me is that view of the water and being around the water. Um, so I was like, how can I, I can't put a whole restaurant out there, but I can use their pier. Right. So, right. and I love that family style feel of our dishes aren't served family style, but the, the atmosphere that you're in is cause we do one long table. So everyone's forced to sit together and have conversations and just fellowship, which is what it's about. Like, yeah. We'll supply the good food, but y'all create the um, conversations and the water being right there. It's just create. I mean, you got to experience a little bit. You did get our one windstorm, so um, <laughs> it was a little unique. But um, yeah, so that was kind of the vision behind it was how can we kind of have the freedom to do whatever we want? Like we've worked for all these restaurants and they are established, know what they're doing, have a great brand and concept. But where can we bounce around and change that up often? So we took matters into our own hands and we're like, we're just going to be all over the place. Sometimes we do a menu based on seasonality, like we talked about. So we did a end of summer harvest, getting all the fresh produce that we could find that people at farmer's markets were trying to get out at the end of summer, which is like when they're the best because they're all bright and flavorful. Um, and then sometimes we just do like, Hey, there's no restaurant around here doing this. Let's kind of get yeah, some feedback great. on it. So yeah. kind of see I mean, what works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of fun with it. So the name Mon Louis, right? So the Mon Louis Island, mm -hmm. I guess maybe a lot of people may not know, that's the island. Technically that... between Fowl River and Dolphin Island. Okay, yeah, yeah that's Mon Louis Island. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so that's the name. Now, I guess, how did you get the idea, though, for the supper club? I mean, most people, you know, maybe members of a supper club where yeah. they go out to eat mm -hmm. or, you know, they eat at each other's house every few weeks. But y'all's is different because it's open to the public, right? It's, yeah. It's, so it's a little bit different. How did you get the idea for the concept? You know, I guess I just thought that was the best uh, noun to use, supper club, for something like this where it didn't have a constant concept behind it, you know? I can't say, oh, we're just seafood or we're just, like, farm to table. I mean, we've done Italian dinners. We've done – and, I mean, it is kind of a club you're part of. You have to join the Facebook group to know anything yeah. about it. That's the only place we advertise. And, I mean, we were doing this in between our, like, full-time jobs, our day jobs. So – we never really had a, a full plan of how we were going to get that out there, but we, we try to get together, come up with a menu, and we present it four weeks before the actual date. So people are having to, like, look out for it, and when they see a menu they like, they sign up, and we limit it to 15 people. So once we cap out at 15, we're done, and yeah. we just offer it to those people. So we've had quite a few people repeat, return, and that's been amazing to see, um, all the way from Dolphin Island to Fair Oak. So yeah. they're coming from all over the place, and I just love seeing that. So really Yeah, it's been cool. really cool. Yeah, I know for what, for the month of April, um, you had a very unique theme. Oh, yeah. And it was based off of my book, The Culinary History mm -hmm. of Mobile. And uh, and I, I know just from the moment that that book was released, I had had in my mind, like, all right, we've got to do some kind of dinner. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in my mind, originally, I thought, oh, you know, we need to get a restaurant to yep. have a ha have the dishes, you know, from this mm -hmm. or from this book. And um, to have someone, it was, I don't know, it was just always an aspiration for me to have someone perform this meal. Yeah. And uh, based off the book. And so, but I'm really thankful that 
you gave the opportunity to do that. Well, thank and you. You yeah. and that, your team, y'all absolutely crushed it that night. I mean, really. And I mentioned earlier, it really was one of those memorable meals That's awesome. that, that I've ever had. So. We had so much fun doing it. We had never, like, featured anything before, you yeah. know. And we not, never had any basis around what we were doing. We're all over the place. So finally having, like, okay, we're going to all read this book and see what we can pull from it. And we got really creative. So. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I really did. Well, let's, uh, you want to go through some of the menu items for that night? And let's just kind of, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll kind of tease yeah. it a little bit and make people really uh, feel like they missed out on the, on the dinner that you've yeah, had. Have but a <laughs> um, I don't know, just kind of give some of the backstory. I know like, so the, you know, the course one was the Alabama pearls and that was the local oysters. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Bama Bay Oyster Farm, which I had never heard of, yeah. um, and then Merle Point the Oyster Farm. Us. Yeah, yeah. So talk about so talk about them a little bit. Well, you know, oysters—that's where your mind goes first when we're talking about being on the bay or in Mobile. So I think, well, I'd say it just the uh, Mobile in general. I mean, yep. any, any any Mobile meal that's would true. have to involve oysters at some point. Yeah. But I think for that one to have having Mobile Bay oysters, that would really yes. really makes it significant because. You know, Mobile Bay oysters are a lot harder to come by now than they've yeah. ever been yeah. throughout our history. So, um, but yeah, talk about some of the local oyster yeah. farms. Where our supper club is located is obviously right there on the bay. But um, we actually just found these people because they saw our sign out front and came by and they're like, you know, we have an oyster farm right down the road. I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> um, they gave us a huge tour. It was really cool. It's Bama Bay oysters. It's about two miles up the road, closer to Fowl River, but they're still right on the mouth of the bay. And um, they have a pier going out there. We got to watch her in December when it was freezing, go out in the water, and she picks up them. And she was showing us from babies, like when they're just tiny little yeah. shells and how they grow in these baskets. And they uh, kind of change them over as they grow. So we got the full experience there. And I just think that's awesome because you're – I mean, she p- delivers them to us that morning of our supper clubs. And she'll bring the basket and just drop them in the bay. And she's like, leave them in there so they stay alive until dinner. Wow. Like, well, that's, you're getting as fresh that's, as they come. That is. That's mm-hmm. as fresh as it gets. That's really cool. Absolutely. And then Murder Point is also kind of our neighbors. They're a few, like 10 minutes away from where we are in Bila Battery. And so we've toured their farm as well. Um, Lane, great guy. He knows what he's doing, obviously. And they've just gotten so popular. Everyone knows yeah, Murder have. Point yeah. now. So I'm like, cool. Someone knows something in our, in our area right. down there. You know, we're not mobile really anymore. We're down in Bila Battery, but... Um, that's always been our yeah. little neighbor. We're still claiming it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think it was cool. Y'all topped the oysters with a pepper jelly, Cajun butter, and a tequila aioli. So yes. it was not just a raw oyster. It was really, really, really fantastic. Mm-hmm. So um, the the next dish that we had was um, uh, the Bama peanut cassolette. Mm-hmm. And it was well, muscadine marinated chicken over collard greens with baked bull peanuts. So I had never mm-hmm. had baked bull peanuts before. How did yeah. you come up with that? Or like, what, what are, where did, what's the story with that? Honestly, a lot from this dish had to do with my time in Napa. Cause I was telling my chef about like, he's like, what makes Alabama unique? Like, what do y'all have there that we don't have? Well, first I tell him about the Jubilees that we have, which we've had right on Mobile Bay. And he was like, have you ever opened a restaurant? So what's their to reaction to that? They, d- they had no idea. We had to YouTube it and show the yeah. whole class. And you know, it also happens in one spot in Japan. He was like, I've never heard of this in my life. He's like, if you open a restaurant, you have to name it Jubilee. Cause that's just so <laughs> unique and special to your area. Um, and then another one was the boiled peanuts. And he was like, what do you do with a boiled peanut? What's it taste like? And all I can describe it as is kind of like a bean, you know? Uh-huh. So that was always my dream is like, how can we incorporate like hearing other people's aspect of, or perception of you know an ingredient that they don't get to try or see all the time how do we highlight that because it's so special so I mean my mom makes amazing boiled peanuts and we also have that Gloria's um, fruit stand on the way to Dolphin Island I'm sure everybody knows uh, that yeah that's right yeah yeah she's got her rusty, there. Mm-hmm, her rusty pot that makes gives it all the flavor <laughs> and it's delicious so we got some of hers and my mom made some we mix it together and then I was like what are we gonna do with these because the flavors there it's amazing but how do we make it not just a boiled peanut and so my mind goes back to beans and I'm like, well, a cassoulet, you know, that's popular in our dishes around here. So we'll bake them. So we literally layered um, a pan with the boiled peanuts and added our bell peppers and onions, um, the Holy Trinity and baked them. And that's where our cassoulet came from. So that's super cool. cool. I th- I'd say that was probably my favorite dish of the whole night. Yeah. That was that it was it had so much flavor. And then, of course, it had uh, some hall sausage mm-hmm. in there as well. Billy's bacon. Yep. Um, and and, and so that one, yeah, so that one, that was probably my favorite dish of the night. That awesome. one, I had that one, I think the people <laughs> around us as well awesome. were talking about that one. Glad to hear And that. I just love the fact that, you know, you're using hall sausage, you know, which 
you know, she's off, Deborah is a friend of our show here, mm-hmm. and um, and just, they've been in Mobile for eighty years. She's now. involved in everything, you know. So yeah, <laughs> she is. She is, and so just love that too. That there was a lot, you know, that local connection. Um, great sausage. I didn't realize how long it had been around. I mean, yeah, it's been in Mobile forever, and it tastes great. So yeah, it was really cool getting to feature so many of our neighbors. And then and yeah, Billy's Bacon. You mm-hmm. know, of course, he's got a huge following around Everybody here as well. That. So. <laughs> Um, the, the third course was Mobile Bay to Table on the Bay, and mm-hmm. that was a redfish on a half shell topped with oyster, uh, West Indies salad and a gumbo butter. Yes. So. Now, how <laughs> did you think of, well, I guess, first of all, I, th- I thought, you know, the West Indies salad, that was really cool. It, it just, it meant a little bit more at, at right your at, at, at mm-hmm. your parents' house right yeah. there, Mile Louis Island, just two miles or so from mm-hmm. where it originated, Bailey's Restaurant. Yeah. Right there on Dolphin Island Parkway, so I don't know that that just I don't know that just made that dish mm-hmm. a little bit more special. Thinking it about it right there, but uh, but how'd you think of that? Like, well, how did you think about topping it on that with the fish? Yeah, everything in that dish really was all about right there in that area. So Bailey's obviously born and raised, going up there. He did invent the West Indies salad, and I mean it's so simple, but it just highlights that crab meat. I mean it's vinegar, onions, and crab meat. So. I was like, how are we going to take that and it not be too much on the redfish, but we have to highlight that, and it's just so good. So we're like, we can make them into fritters and just fry them. Who doesn't like something fried? So we tried it out. They turned out really good. Yeah. We're like, that's going on top of the fish. <laughs> yeah, it was a great idea. It was awesome. We loved how that turned out. And then um, also talking about stuff from right there, gumbo. I mean, we love gumbo. We do have a little bit of a split house because Hunter is from Louisiana, so he likes his really dark. I'm very biased to my mom's. <laughs> Hers is my top favorite ever, um, loaded with seafood. And so we had to find somewhere right in the middle to make that. It's a little darker than my mom would like it, but it's a little light for Hunter. But That's really funny. All right, you got to listen to the last episode of the podcast that I okay. had with David Hubble. Uh-huh. And he's a gumbo historian and expert on gumbo. And we talked about this, like the different, you know, and this, <laughs> this is, is really fitting that he's from so Louisiana. Different. In Cajun country, and mm-hmm. you're from here in Mobile. We talked about that. Those it's differences. so different. It's crazy, yeah. and he can be really rude about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have to get on to Hunter sometimes. All um, right. Well, so maybe he needs to listen to that episode then. Yeah, we talk about okay. how we can, like, you know, bridge that gap. Of, okay. You know, we have there's different cultures, <laughs> and Mobile has its own gumbo, mm-hmm. and it's not wrong. Mm-mm. You know, and Louisiana has their their style of gumbo. It's not wrong either. Yeah. Um, so we'll let them stir the roof for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to take it off the stove a little earlier. That's it. Um, but yeah, so then the concept there was the flavor of gumbo how do we get that into a butter we really have been following a guy that makes all these unique butters in india and he uses their like really strong seasonings and herbs to make the butter and we're like well what's mobile about gumbo how do we turn that into a butter it's just something different taking something that we know and turning it into a different flavor profile and again hunter with his gumbo i guess he does take it very seriously he will not he does not want to put it in a blender but that's how you have to get this butter so he, pours, he makes the gumbo, pours it into the blender, and then walks away because he said that's a sin. <laughs> um, and I turn the blender on, and uh, we just puree the heck out of the gumbo and strain it and fold it into our butter, and it just tastes like really rich gumbo. It is, and it's so good. It's so good. And y'all had some little biscuits that you passed around as well that had the gumbo yeah. butter, and yeah. that was really good too. The fourth dish, was, or the fourth course, was South Alabama Harvest with pork tenderloin, Stuff with jalapeno, cream cheese, have, have squash casserole, zucchini, okra, tomatoes, turnip green, uh, pecan pesto. That was so good. That one was so good, too. Just mm-hmm. the fresh vegetables. You could tell everything was fresh. Um, so talk a little bit about that. And, and I guess, you know, how y'all source, how you source some of the local ingredients at the Supper yeah. Club. We, um, you know, for that dish specifically, that's a lot of what your book was about. It goes all over the place with different vegetables. I was like, we can use any vegetable. It seems like all of them have been yeah, brought here right. by, through each chapter. It was all someone bringing over vegetables. So, um, and we just have such an abundance of them here. Why not highlight that? So we did kind of go all over the place. We started over in Fairhope. They had a farmer's market going on and we got some produce from there. Um, we got one from Robertsdale through Capital City Produce. And then we finished up at Gloria's because that's always our last stop right. before we get to mom's <laughs> house. And so we can pick up any last things we need. And I mean, it was a really good time of year for that too. We were able to get yeah, everything super fresh. that's a fresh. good point. Um, you know, and everything in that dish is so just screams Alabama and our produce. And the pecans, you know, we had to throw that in there. That's right. Because, um, we use that. 
Um, I think that turned out really good. It was a very comfort food. We all know. I don't know. That was always my grandmother's thing was that rolled pork tenderloin with the cream cheese and jalapeno. So I can't beat that. And then you throw all those vegetables on there. That was a good way to end, end the the savory. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By that point in the night, I think everybody was like, how are we going to finish <laughs> this meal? We still have two more to go. Uh, or, but so the last one was the dessert. And yes. that was a, uh, of course, you named it a home of Mardi Gras, Mon Louis moon pie with a homemade marshmallow. Yes. <laughs> pecan cookie drizzled with a chocolate sauce and a banana brulee. you got to talk about that so for good. sure. Um, yeah, you see how uh, vague we left it on the menu. We just called it a Mon Louis yeah. Island moon pie because we had no <laughs> idea what we were going to do yet. Um, but we were like, how are we going to take something so iconic because that's just so fitting for this dinner? and make it something that they haven't had before. Like we can't just take a moon pie and cut it in half and call it deconstructed. So how are we gonna make this uh, really where you can tell we put in the work and the, made it from scratch and just a little unique and different. So I uh, talked to you too about our team. So we kind of are working with local, um, really young professionals in the industry that wanna learn more, push their boundaries. And I'm gonna give all the credit on this one to David Parrish. He's a, a culinary student. Um, he just graduated actually from Coastal. He's been working between Hunter and I since our days back at Sunset Point. So um, followed us around, been working with us for a long time. And that was his project was, hey, figure out how we're going to make this moon pie from scratch and make it different. And so, you know, we gave him some nudges like you can make your own marshmallows or we can make the almond cookie because that's technically what is in the base of the um, moon pie. And we set him on his way. And I think he told the story that night he was using his KitchenAid mixer to make the marshmallow and he almost broke the thing. Yeah. I think it started smoking on him, but <laughs> it was worth it, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was so good. I told yeah, we him love that. It was worth it. So yeah, that was really creative. Yeah, that was an awesome way to to kind of present that differently. Well, yeah, still I've, never had a, I've never really had a homemade moon pie yeah. that, that tasted anything like that. So yeah. yeah, that was good. Couldn't have been easy to pull off either. <laughs> I just, I, I love that our dinner just, you know, like I said, you had so many local ingredients just from the produce to, you know, like I said, the hall sausage and Billy's bacon, oysters. That was just, that was my favorite. That was just my whole favorite thing about I the whole time. I loved it. It was night. amazing. Yeah, it was good. If you need us to, if you write another book, we'll do another dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. That Mac taught me in writing another yeah. book right there. <laughs> just for the dinner. Awesome. Talk about your dinner in the month of June. You dinner in Paris is what y'all yes. announced it this weekend. Um, we so what can we expect for the dinner in June? So the inspiration behind this one actually came, we were watching a documentary on um, Alenia, which is a restaurant in Chicago, a really great chef Atkins. Um, and his theme too for his restaurant was like, he kind of had the same thing going on where how can I jump around and do different things? And, you know, we don't want to exhaust one specific area of it. Like we're just doing countries. Like we don't want to just jump around from different countries or even like this local or farm to table. So now it was like pick a specific time and place and year and base it on that. And so that's kind of what we were trying to do with this. We're still really early on. We announced the dinner, but we don't have the menu yet. So um, it was like 1980s, picture yourself in Paris. What are you doing? Like you're going to the nice cafes out in the town. They do have that river right there. So I'm like, we're right on the bay. Um, what can we do that's different? And there's not really a French restaurant around here that pops to mind. So Hoping right. we can introduce some new dishes that people haven't had before, but still utilizing stuff that we can get our hands on here. Yeah. So. All right. So I see y'all's creativity on that. Yes. One. So we'll how hopefully can, have that out soon. How can people reserve their spot and, and just follow along with y'all? Yeah. So if we're on Facebook under Mon Louis Supper Club. Um, we release the theme at the beginning of the month, and then a couple days after, we'll have that menu out. And all you have to do is message me. You can have my phone number, or you can message me on uh, on Facebook or Instagram. And I'll just get back to you. And we just require a minimum donation of 125 per person. That covers the five course meal and a mocktail. And so okay. that's how we're doing things right now. And yep. it's going really well. Yeah, you got yep. to do it. You got to follow the Facebook page. So five Facebook tickets page. already just off the theme. They don't even know the menu. Right. I'm like, I hope you like <laughs> escargot if we throw it on there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's super exciting. I love that we have such a great following. And people that are interested, because that was the whole purpose. We yeah. really, the point of the supper club was to see you know, because obviously Hunter and I have goals to open up something eventually in the area. We wanted to see, we're getting some um, research done on the area of Mon Louis because, you know, that's a potential area that we would love to open something. And I know it's not full of restaurants right now. Right. So we wanted to see people are willing to drive there. 
Um, and then also just like feedback on the food that they like. Like yeah. how much can we really push those boundaries? Because yeah. people call themselves foodies sometimes, but then when they tell me they can't eat an oyster <laughs> and they live in Alabama, I'm like, are you a foodie? No. <laughs> yeah, so we're working on that, but it's been really fun. That's what I, I, Y'all are so creative and, you know, yeah, I think any of the dinners are going to be just spectacular because of how creative y'all are. And I, you have a great idea as well of what people like. I think mm-hmm. that's what, that's what, you know, I don't know, y- y'all make a good team. Yes, we, we enjoy it so much. It's been so fun. All right, well, let's move on to our next segment of the podcast, Meet and Three. Okay. And this is, uh, we've gotten into the meat of the podcast. I've got three questions for you and um, just kind of want to get your thoughts. And the first one is, uh, you know, just talk about where you and Hunter go, like, for a night out. Like, what are some of y'all's favorite places that y'all like to go? So, currently, we live in Daphne, across the bay, and so our date nights consist of us going into Fairhope, going into town. Yeah. <laughs> Not that far. <laughs> um, but Pearl is at the top of our list right now. Okay. So Pearl right in downtown Fairhope. They are, they're a husband and wife team as well. So yep. that's kind of some inspo for us. But um, just doing great things. I was telling you, they have a blue crab fried rice, and that is killer. So that's Hunter's go-to. i got to have that. Yes. I've got to have that. Yes, get back over there. And they're also starting some, like, wine dinners as well. We yeah, attended they've one been of those. doing those once a month. Yeah, how was that? Really good. We went around Christmas time, and so it was amazing. Great experience. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They're pumping out some really great food. Yeah. And I think it's really unique to the area, too. You know, like, they're kind of doing what we're doing. Like, we want to ease you in with familiar ingredients, but also how can we um, – you know highlight that and elevate it to the next level yeah he's doing a great job yeah they are doing a good job with that yeah i know they've always got local oysters and and always Mm -hmm. good local seafood and um and even little the lunch special there's not a big lunch menu item but Mm -hmm. um i had the shrimp po' boy with leidenheimer bread you know and so it's just it's fantastic Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) so they're doing a good job um what about uh what's some under the radar places around town that don't get much love that y'all like going to so when we had to make the trek over to mom's house uh, for the supper club, we hit up um, the Lighthouse Cafe. And so they have the best hidden secret of the biggest fried crab claws. Yeah. If, if you're you looking know, you for know. Those, yeah, you know. <laughs> they're worth it. They're worth the money that they've spiked to as well. But um, <laughs> if you want some big ones that are worth your money, those, that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We yeah. love it. The next one is, uh, so you, you've done a lot of traveling. Yes. Um, and I don't know how you know extensive you got to experience some of the food scenes in those places that you travel, but you know what would you say like what was what was a memorable some memorable experiences you had uh, in in your years of traveling? That's a lot. That um, opens a big box. Um, but I would say the most iconic experience for me was when I got back from my externship. I it was paid, so I had saved up a little bit of money, and I really wanted to. Like I was telling you how it was eye-opening up there of the scene, culinary scene and how different it was. I wanted to explain that to my family from home. So I had my parents and my brother fly to New York City, and I paid for our 12-course meal at Per Se. Oh, wow. Okay. And just to explain, like, hey, this is what I'm talking about when I say multiple courses, fine dining, like, to a tea service. And, you know, the, like, we're not thinking, we're thinking Felix's yeah. is what to a tea service is. But it's even the next level, um, way next level. So... That was really special for me to one, like, that was kind of my first paycheck to be like, I can actually take my family out to dinner. <laughs> finally paid your dad back all those years. <laughs> yeah, finally, a little. <laughs> and um, and just, like, for them to get to see that, too, of like, hey, this is maybe not exactly what I'm going to go into, but this is that next level of, like, this is what I'm learning in school, and this is what I would have the potential to do one day. And um, this is how elevated food can get and just... Like seeing my dad have the salmon tartare in a savory like uh, seed sesame seed cone. He don't even eat salmon, much less does he know what tartare meant. So having him eat that and be like, wow, what was that? It was amazing. And just sitting there, I mean, that was our first time we had to actually sit down and have like I think we were there for three and a half hours. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. like yes, it was amazing. So that's most memorable for me and it's on my list to take um hunter and my future kids one day hopefully to just see that like we don't get to experience that so yeah that'd be cool that's top on the list that was my turning moment all right i got a new segment of the podcast i'm going to introduce on this podcast episode it's called fork in the road and this is where i talk about new and upcoming food news going around in the community and so this could be like a new restaurant that's coming soon, maybe a new menu drop, or just some rumors that I've heard around town that I'll be uh, sharing with y'all on the podcast. So uh, I'll feature one of these per episode. The debut of the Fork in the Road segment I was going out to Westmobile, and the owners of Domkey Market uh, have created a new concept out there called Amici Wine Bar and Trattoria. And so it's going to be located at Cottage Hill and Schillinger, where the uh, Hungry Owl building was built out there. 
Uh, most recently, Margo was the um, uh, restaurant that was in that location, but uh, I think it's going to be really good. They're planning to have some authentic Italian dishes there, which Mobile desperately needs, you know, and, and then I think, you know, it seems like they're going to be playing to the strengths of what made Dom Key Market so popular, you know, their wine bar and their huge selection of wine that they have. So uh, just, you know, having a, a big space there for events that they do a lot of. I think that's um, kind of reminds me a little bit of Provision and Fairhope, you know, a little bit, maybe with... Uh, uh, but like I said, with Italian dishes on the menu. So uh, I think they're going to do well in that location and, you know, another much needed locally owned spot in, out in West Mobile too. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the fork in the road segment for this week. Uh, the next segment is Chris's Dishes. And that's where I talk about the best dish that I've had lately. And then uh, I'll turn it over to you, Amber. If you've got a dish that you've had lately, you want to talk about too. But um, a couple, last week, we took our kids to Dolphins. And uh, we just, uh, our kids were very smart this year in school. They made all A's all nice. year long. So we wanted to do something really fun, do something different, treat them to a nice night. So we made them get dressed up, which they hated. <laughs> Two of them hated. Uh, one of them kind of enjoyed it. But uh, we decided to do the chef's table at Dolphins. And you can reserve that chef's table uh, really anytime. If they've got it available, if you've got, it, it holds six people. Um, so, I mean, I think if you've got two or four or six, it don't matter, um, you can reserve the chef's table for no extra charge. So, that was really cool, too. And uh, just getting to go back into the kitchen and, mm -hmm. you know, it just it gives, it, it gives dolphins certainly a different experience. You know, it's a little bit louder than, say, you know, maybe not as stuffy. So, it, it's pretty cool for kids. So, that's, that'd be something to consider, too. But um, I had the dolphins dolphin. Which is a, uh, which I didn't realize that dolphin was uh, Hawaiian for mahi mahi. And so it's mahi mahi and it has their, like a creamy shrimp sauce, it has saffron rice. And um, anyway, it was really, really good. And I, 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 I like dolphins. I like how they, you know, how they, they, they put a little bit of Creole and Caribbean, you know, to some of their, to some of their menu items. So it just, I don't know, it's a little bit different than, you know, than, than some of the normal seafood restaurants around town. But, um, uh, it was it was great great experience you know love the food love the views and uh and love being back there in the chef's table so that was that's my dish for the week but uh amber what you got any you got a, a dish that you've had lately you want to shout out i'm trying to think because hunter and i haven't been going out lately <laughs> he's finally cooking at home for once um can i circle back to that one yeah <laughs> okay i'll have to this think of it okay <laughs> or if you just want to shout somebody out where have we been going lately um, and it don't have to be like Oh, we went to Chuck's Fish the other day, and that was delicious. I'll talk about Chuck's Fish. Okay. So I had a girls' night. Hunter didn't take me on a date night. That didn't happen. <laughs> um, but we had a girls' night. We went to Chuck's Fish, and that place is obviously a staple, and it's always been really great. But um, I had um, the Brussels sprouts, and those are amazing. Because oh, yeah. you don't expect that when you're going for sushi. But we started the meal with the Brussels sprouts, and they were yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, good call. Good call. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, but I've had those Brussels sprouts, so those are <laughs> really, really good. So good. There, and that's, that's something that... I was just talking to somebody about this. I can't remember when, when we were talking about it. But anyway, Brussels sprouts, like, I, I never grew up eating Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. um, now, all of a sudden, these restaurants have got, there's some really good Brussels sprouts around town. They um, figured out how to sauce them up and fry them for I us so, so. We, yeah. so we like it. <laughs> make it. Yeah, make it a lot easier for us to eat. Yeah. Yes. Well, Amber, awesome. this has been such a good episode. I appreciate you coming on the yeah. podcast with me. Good it's seeing so good. you. Thank you yep. so much. We'll cook dinner again for you soon. All right. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> I'm going to be coming back out there for sure to the Mon Louis Supper Club very soon. And, and I, I would definitely encourage everybody to go, um, not just because you're sitting here. I would <laughs> I would encourage people to go. Um, uh, it's, it's a great date night. Uh, the view out there is incredible. Um, yeah. And even on a windy night like we had, <laughs> it was still incredible <laughs> under the porch, you know, yes. so yeah. Um, Awesome. I, I, don't don't let the weather deter you from going. <laughs> They're gonna make it happen. Their hospitality is fantastic. Food's fantastic. So just you just gotta do it. Yeah. All right. Thanks again for coming on. Uh, we'll see. Catch you on the next episode. Thank you.